Hey, Retcon Raider here. Before we get started, I'd just like to thank the Raiders, the fine folks who have helped make videos like this one possible, with special thanks going out to A Nerd in Warpaint, Matthew Holmquist, Nathan Welch Jr., and Valen Rook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. So, Wasteland 3's been out for a couple of weeks, and in that time, I have more or less fully consumed its contents. That's not to say that my gameplay series is over. That's going to take at least another 30 or so episodes. But it has been enough time to more or less give me a good idea of what the overall launch version of the game has to offer. Now, this isn't a review, but I will say that despite a few rough edges... I thoroughly enjoyed the game. I wouldn't be doing a series on it otherwise, and I certainly don't regret backing it. However, as one of the original backers on Fig, and someone who regularly devours things like dev blogs and trailers, I couldn't help but notice that a lot of the content that was showcased in those early teasers didn't actually end up making it into the final product. To be fair, that's actually pretty common, especially these days with the advent of crowdfunded indie games. In the vast majority of cases, the developers are barely past the prototype or conceptual stage when they first put these campaigns together, and a lot can end up changing in the years between a game being funded and actually hitting launch. Still, it is fun to imagine what could have been. So today, I thought we'd take a quick look at what we do know about some of the most prominent cut content. There's actually a surprising amount of stuff to talk about, but in the interest of keeping this video down to a semi-reasonable runtime, we'll just focus on the items I find most intriguing. The five major locations that didn't end up making it into the final game, as well as what we know about the associated characters, quests, and lore. But hey, if you want to hear me spend more time talking about this sort of thing in the future, then feel free to let me know down in the comments. There's plenty of other cut content I wouldn't mind yammering about, and it's not just restricted to Wasteland 3. Anyway, as I was saying, in following the game's development, one of the things I found most fascinating was that several of the locations showcased during the Fig campaign never actually made it into the final product. In fact, if we go back and look at the original batch of publicly released concept art, most of it gorgeously rendered by the Bischoff brothers, we can actually see that of the eight distinct locations showcased, only half of them actually made it into the game. Now, again, this isn't terribly unusual. After all, the original crowdfunding campaign was all the way back in 2016, and a lot can change in the span of four years. The weird thing, though, is that the developers obviously put a lot of work into designing and at least partially implementing each of these four missing locations, as well as a fifth major location, which we'll get to at the end of the video. Take, for example, the Cathedral of Holy Detonation, a rather striking piece of concept art depicting a mysterious cult worshipping some sort of giant, miraculously stable nuclear reaction, the Holy Detonation. The developers never spent much time talking about this location, but they did feature a short, partially redacted, lore blurb way back in Fig Update number 5, October of 2016. According to that lore fragment, the Cathedral of Holy Detonation was housed in some sort of massive, subterranean research lab, concealed beneath an old and mostly abandoned Air Force base. The anomaly itself was some sort of stable and perpetual plasma eruption, measuring roughly 20 meters across and suspended in midair. It was highly radioactive, but despite that, some sort of cult consisting of at least 15 individuals had taken to worshipping it. Apparently, this cult had constructed some sort of subterranean chapel around the anomaly inside the confines of the enormous testing chamber. They showed their religious fervor in self-destructive rituals, standing dangerously close to the anomaly while reciting mathematical formulas 
or even plunging their limbs into the anomaly, perhaps in a misguided attempt to feed it. Now, the original lore blurb doesn't go into much more detail than that, and the developers never mention this location again after 2016. However, despite that, there are still fragments of this location and the associated quest in the launch version of the game. For example, if you study the in-game world map, you can actually see a handful of very distinct location markers that are never actually used throughout the main campaign. In fact, if you travel just a little bit north of Colorado Springs, you'll discover two such locations in very close proximity to each other. Given the location, the scenery, and the very distinctive structure at the northern location marker, this is obviously intended to be the U.S. Air Force Academy, which features a very distinctive chapel. This is almost certainly where the player was intended to discover the Cathedral of Holy Detonation. Not only is it a fairly prominent Air Force facility, relatively close to Colorado Springs, but the presence of the massive chapel would also help explain what had inspired the cult of Holy Detonation to start worshipping the strange anomaly in the first place. On top of that, data miners have also discovered a faction logo for the cult of Holy Detonation, along with logos for several other factions that didn't actually end up making it into the final game. It's also worth noting that there is actually an NPC back in Colorado Springs named Theodoric Curie. In the launch build of the game, he serves no obvious purpose, beyond providing some minor lore related to Colorado Springs and its defense network. Specifically, he talks about how he helped design those defenses, a series of powerful Tesla coils, which are now inactive because the Gippers have stopped sending the oil that's needed to fuel it. However, at one point, he also mentions that his parents were scientists experimenting with cold fusion. This would seem to imply that Theodoric Curie was intended to be a part, if not the instigator, of the main quest surrounding the Cathedral of Holy Detonation. In fact, recently discovered epilogue segments do, in fact, seem to confirm that this mysterious nuclear anomaly was intended to serve as a potential power source for Colorado Springs, essentially an alternative to the oil shipments that the city was otherwise dependent on. Now, sadly, the unimplemented epilogues don't really tell us much beyond that. We still don't know who the cultists were, or how the player could deal with them, or even what the nature of the anomaly might have been. Given the relative simplicity of the location and the related epilogues, it's likely the cult were just intended to serve as a basic, if bizarre, enemy faction for the player to slaughter. What we do know, though, is that there was one other potential use for the Holy Detonation. Aside from turning it over to Colorado Springs, the player could also somehow destabilize it, causing the Holy Detonation to finally finish detonating. This would immediately bring the campaign to a premature end, as the Cathedral, Colorado Springs, Ranger Headquarters, and Team November were all vaporized in a long-delayed nuclear blast. Neat. Now, since we just talked about Theodoric Curie, I think the next cut location we should discuss is the Great Dunes, also sometimes referred to as the Storm in Chains. Just like the Cathedral of Holy Detonation, this mysterious location was vividly depicted in one of the very first pieces of concept art released for the Wasteland 3 crowdfunding campaign. Again, beautifully rendered by the incredible Bischoff brothers. Much like with the cathedral, we don't actually know a whole lot about what the developers had planned for this particular location. However, again, much like with the cathedral, the developers did release a short fragment of lore way back in FIG update number 13, November of 2016. In retrospect, this lore fragment was actually very intriguing. It features Dr. Ellen Buchanan, the Patriarch's mother, who, as far as I'm aware, 
is never actually mentioned in the main game itself. It describes how she and her albino driver, Patch, stumbled across this location in 2022, roughly 25 years after the Deluge of Fire, and roughly 85 years before the events of Wasteland 3. There, she discovered a series of massive crystalline globes, each one roughly 25 feet in diameter, and filled with an intricate network of sparking electrical wires. Every so often, arcs of electricity would leap from one globe to another, triggering a thunder-like boom. She was soon confronted by a short, mostly naked figure with metal rods strapped to his back. He identified himself as Spark Singer, and appeared to have foreknowledge of who Ellen was and why she was there. He further identified the mysterious globes as the Storm in Chains, which he described as preserved minds from before the war. However, before he could say anything else, some sort of dispute broke out between Sparksinger and Dr. Buchanan's albino driver. The two appeared to have some sort of innate animosity towards each other, but the lore fragment ends before this can be explored any further. Now, again, this is a location that didn't end up making it into the final game, but it does appear to have at least made it into a late stage of the game's development. For example, based on context clues, most notably the mention of Fort Garland, we do know that the most likely location for this strange landmark is the Great Sand Dunes National Park, roughly 150 miles southwest of Colorado Springs. In fact, if we actually travel to the very southwestern corner of the world map, we're greeted by this rather peculiar sight, a snow-covered desert and a series of massive glass domes. Based on the description from the lore fragment, this was obviously intended to be the Great Dunes, where the player was intended to discover the storm and chains. Even stranger, Although the player can't actually trigger or enter this location in any way, purchasing the Explorer perk will actually mark this as an undiscovered location, but the player still can't actually enter it. What's more, although this location isn't mentioned in any of the uh, datamined game files, the Lightning Shamans are. Much like with the Cult of Holy Detonation, the game files still include art assets related to the unimplemented Lightning Shaman faction, likely the faction that Sparksinger was intended to belong to. Data miners have also apparently discovered an unimplemented Lightning Staff weapon, again, likely related to both Sparksinger and the Lightning Shamans. Although tenuous, this might also link back to Theodoric Curie. Perhaps he was intended to point the player in this direction, in hopes of uncovering an alternate power supply, or perhaps just for some sort of upgrade to his Tesla-based defense system. Sadly, beyond that, we really don't know much else about what the developers had planned for this particular location. Based on the lore fragment, it sounds like the Storm in Chains was intended to be some sort of repository for human minds, somehow stored in a digital medium. It's also possible that it might have been intended to house artificial or machine intelligences. Perhaps one of the more intriguing details of the small bit of lore we did receive is the strange animosity between Sparksinger and the albino driver. That actually leads us to the third location on our list, Cheyenne Mountain. Or, more specifically, the Cheyenne Mountain NORAD Complex. Now this is a location that I think a lot of us were fully expecting to encounter in the final game, and it does in fact appear in one of the original pieces of concept art. Unlike the previous two locations we discussed, however, the developers never actually revealed anything about what they had planned for this particular location. Instead, pretty much everything we know comes from fragments of information obtained from the actual game files. For example, much like the cathedral, data miners discovered that the game files contain epilogue segments and art assets related to this location. 
they even apparently discovered small segments of dialogue, which gave additional information about characters that the player would be able to encounter there, including a potential companion. Based on the information uncovered, Cheyenne Mountain was intended to be home to the Faders, a group of cloned super-soldiers. Holdovers from before the Deluge of Fire, these clones were genetically engineered to be physically superior to normal humans, including an unnatural tolerance to cold, which also gave them an albino-like appearance. Cut off from their handlers after the apocalypse, they slowly grew increasingly insular and inhuman in their behavior. They focus on operating with ruthless efficiency, always working for the good of the Fader Collective. They have no individual names or personalities, instead answering to call signs or numbers, and if one of them is ever killed, or even just seriously injured, they're recycled back into their base genetic material so a replacement soldier can be grown in their place. What's more, they've also become obsessed with the idea of somehow rebuilding the American dream. Though, as with many old world concepts, their idea of the American dream has grown twisted in the years since the deluge of fire. They now believe themselves to be the pinnacle of humanity, and that baseline humans are simply too weak to survive in this harsh new world. This has led them towards a series of increasingly vile pursuits, all under the guidance of their general, a clone simply known as Researcher 88. They raid nearby settlements and take humans captive, harvesting them for genetic material or using them as lab rats for a series of increasingly deadly bioweapons. Their intention is to eventually create an artificial virus so potent that it can wipe out all normal humans, while leaving the faders themselves untouched. Although largely speculative on my part, this might tie back into that small fragment of lore that the developers teased us with back in 2016. If the Storm in Chains is indeed a repository for human minds from before the war, then the faders might have a vested interest in gaining access to it, or perhaps simply destroying it. That is, of course, assuming that Dr. Buchanan's albino driver was, in fact, a member of the Fader Collective. It's also possible that he was something else entirely, such as a mutant, or possibly even an early example of a synth. From a gameplay standpoint, it sounds as if the Faders were intended to serve as a fairly straightforward antagonist. Because the Rangers were normal humans, the Faders would have very little respect for them, and might even respond to them with overt hostility. If the player simply ignored the Faders, then they would continue to prey on anyone unlucky enough to cross their paths, eventually evolving into a threat to the entirety of Colorado. If the player decided to confront them instead, then it would almost certainly lead to a fairly standard, if dangerous, combat scenario though the player would need to destroy the faction's gene bank to truly defeat them. Otherwise, the faders would simply gather their dead and recycle them into new soldiers. However, the epilogue segments do seem to imply that it would be possible for the players to somehow work out an uneasy truce with the faders, though it doesn't actually specify how. Now, I will admit, again, this is pure speculation on my part, but I think it's important to remember that the Cheyenne Mountain Complex is actually the secondary NORAD command center. The primary command center is actually located in the Peterson Air Force Base, which, in Wasteland 3, now serves as the new Ranger headquarters. Knowing this, it's entirely possible that the player might have been able to somehow find a way to communicate between the two facilities. In that case, it's possible that the Faders would recognize the Rangers as some sort of legitimate authority. In fact, looking back at the actual finished game, the player can discover an old VR headset linked to the Cheyenne Mountain computer network. It's possible that this was originally intended to serve as some sort of mission item, 
related to contacting and potentially working out a truce with the Fader Collective. Given that the player could also apparently recruit one of the Faders as a companion, it's likely that this was also tied into working out that nebulous truce. This potential companion, a woman simply named Jane Doe, might have been intended to serve as an emissary or liaison back to the Fader Collective. Perhaps the player would have been tasked with trying to convince her that normal humans deserve to live, with the results of their efforts determining whether or not the Faders would continue honoring the truce after the campaign was over. Moving on, our next stop is the Historic Stanley Hotel, or as it was going to be called in Wasteland 3, the Everest Hotel. Now this is a weird one, because of the five cut locations, this is by far the one that we know the most about. And that's because, aside from showcasing concept art during the early crowdfunding campaign, the developers also did multiple dev blogs specifically focusing on the concept, lore, and area design for this particular area. On top of that, data miners have also discovered art assets and epilogue segments linked to the Everest in the game files. There's actually a radio advert for the Everest in the finished game, and, um... You know how both the Cathedral of Holy Detonation and the Storm in Chains had obvious markers on the world map? Well, <laughs> they actually repurposed the world map marker for the Everest into the world map marker for Colorado Springs. If I had to guess, it was supposed to be in the conspicuous dead end between Aspen and Denver, but, for whatever reason, the developers ended up cutting it out of the final campaign, and recycling at least some of the associated assets. Now, ignoring that, based on the fairly significant amount of information that we know about this particular location, we know that it was heavily inspired by the Overlook Hotel from Stephen King's The Shining, which, in turn, was based on the historic Stanley Hotel in Colorado. According to the early dev blogs, this location would be home to a mysterious cult known as the Caretakers, an outwardly friendly and dutiful group of servants and staff that maintained the hotel. By all outward appearances, the Everest itself would be a luxurious five-star hotel, or at least the closest you could find to a luxury hotel in post-apocalyptic Colorado. However, it would be surrounded by a much more ominously named Suicide Forest, a dense thicket of woods filled with frozen corpses of former guests who had wandered away from the hotel to apparently hang themselves. Delving into the lore surrounding this grim location, it would apparently date all the way back to the Deluge of Fire. The Everest had apparently been remote enough from any centers of civilization that it had been spared the nuclear Armageddon that had claimed most of Colorado. The guests, mostly wealthy socialites and business magnates, spent their final days gorging and enjoying all the most lavish luxuries that the old world had to offer. But then, faced with the reality of having to return to a world that had now been destroyed, they instead chose to kill themselves en masse. The only survivors of this horrid affair were the dutiful waitstaff, who then dedicated themselves to continue maintaining the hotel. Over the ensuing decades, the waitstaff slowly transformed into something much more sinister, a delusional cult that apparently felt it was their responsibility to provide travelers with a permanent means of escaping the horrors of this now-blighted world they would send out ambiguous radio messages, at least one of which is still actually in the game, inviting weary travelers to come find their final rest. According to one of the lore blurbs from an early dev blog, the caretakers believed that by killing people inside the Everest, their spirits would be trapped in its halls, somehow protecting the place, while the Everest would, in turn, somehow protect those spirits from the world outside. <laughs> 
they resented any implications that they were actually just killing people, instead preferring to use euphemisms that would often confuse or mislead their guests, who would then inevitably find their way into the intricate murder maze that the caretakers had constructed inside the actual hotel. According to the multiple dev blogs released about this particular location, the player would first be pointed towards the Everest by a man named Donnelly, whose business partner had gone missing after visiting the hotel. He would hire the rangers to go rescue his partner, or, failing that, to at least recover a disc that his partner had been carrying. This would require the player to navigate their way through the hazards of the suicide forest, and then contend with the caretaker cult, and possibly their murder maze as well. Although the specifics are pretty hazy, we do at least know from the unimplemented epilogues that the player would ultimately be able to resolve this side quest in various amusing ways. They could convince the caretakers to change the way they did business, either by turning the Everest into an actual legitimate hotel, or by at least more clearly explaining the services they offered to their guests. They could also simply slaughter the caretakers, either through conventional combat, or, in a nod to the original story that inspired the location, they could tamper with the hotel's boiler and cause the entire building to explode. While we don't know much in the way of specific details about how the Everest was actually going to be laid out, or how the quest was going to progress, the developers did actually give us a glimpse at several work-in-progress maps for the surrounding suicide forest. Aside from the frozen corpses, this area would feature potential hazards in the form of traps, bears, and enormous wildcats, an enemy that didn't actually end up making it into the final game. They even laid out a fairly straightforward encounter that they had planned for this area, the player would stumble across a small abandoned hunting camp where they could discover clues as to the fate of the missing hunters. If they decided to follow these clues, they would eventually be contacted by a small number of surviving hunters who were still being stalked by some sort of inhuman creature. The player would ultimately need to decide if they wanted to save the hunters, kill the hunters and loot their bodies, or simply walk away. Finally, that brings us to our fifth cut location, Steel Town, a location that the developers basically never talked about during the game's development. From what little we know, Steel Town was originally intended to serve as one of the main quest hubs in the game. It's even still referred to, at least in passing, in the main campaign, with some residents of Colorado Springs mentioning that Steeltown is one of the only settlements left in the area. Curiously, you can even encounter characters from Steeltown, most notably Boulder and Local 168, a troop of mercenaries who are former scrap miners from Steeltown, who were fired after they tried to form a union. They make specific reference to Abigail Markham, the foreman at the Steeltown factory, a major NPC that the player was supposed to encounter at this location, and one of three potential characters that could ultimately end up controlling it. Now, sadly, the vast majority of what we know about Steel Town comes almost entirely from a series of 20 unimplemented epilogue segments, describing the aftermath of the player's potential actions. Aside from that, the only other information we have to go off of are a few unused art assets, a few snippets of in-game dialogue, and the fairly conspicuous location marker that the player can still find near the southern edge of the world map. I'm fairly certain that Steel Town was supposed to be based on the city of Pueblo, Colorado. In the real world, Pueblo is known as Steel City because it's one of the largest steel-producing cities in the United States of America. In Wasteland 3, it appears that this location was intended to effectively serve as the industrial center of Colorado Springs, manufacturing the bulk of the weapons and equipment used by the Patriarch and his marshals. Looking at the epilogue segments, it sounds like the majority of Pueblo 
was actually destroyed during the Deluge of Fire, with the majority of the workers instead now living in a makeshift arcology simply known as the Factory. Based on the distinctive landmark used on the world map, I'm guessing that this arcology was based out of the old Colorado Fuel and Iron Facility, which technically went out of business back in 1982, but keep in mind that Wasteland 3 uses an alternate version of our history that essentially plateaued during the 1980s. Now, again, looking at the epilogue segments and the dialogue with Boulder, we know that Steeltown was supposed to be run by a woman named Abigail Markham. I even found a concept render of Abigail Markham's face, which just goes to show how far along they were with this location before they ended up deciding to cut it. Apparently, Miss Markham was an overly demanding genius who expected nothing short of perfection from her workers, which was causing a steadily growing amount of friction between her and her perpetually dwindling workforce. Faced with a potential labor crisis, it appears that she was instead turning her attention towards trying to automate, or at least optimize, the facility with something called the Computation Engine. Ultimately, the player would of course need to pick sides. The three major players in this particular drama were Abigail Markham, the current foreman of the factory, as well as two other women, a con artist named Benny Bianchi, who was looking to plunder the factory's coffers, and a refugee-turned-laborer named Saline Crow, who was apparently pushing for fairer working conditions. They each represented a pretty obvious moral choice. The patriarch would prefer to have the player support Markham, while the refugees would instead prefer Crow. Bianchi would obviously be the worst person to put in charge of the factory, but she would likely compensate the player with a rather lavish reward for doing so, before promptly running Steeltown into the ground. The other significant wrinkle in this otherwise fairly straightforward standoff was the mysterious computation engine itself, which the player would be able to potentially fix, sabotage, or ignore. It would ultimately determine how well Steeltown would function for whoever ended up running it. Ultimately, it would work best in conjunction with Boss Markham, modestly well for Saline Crow, and it really wouldn't matter with Bianchi. One peculiar element to this particular subplot is that there are also sporadic references to this engine somehow being related to synths. Although it's a little hard to say for certain, I believe the automation that Boss Markham is attempting to implement is directly related to somehow enslaving a group of synths. So, not only would the player have to determine who would be left in charge of Steeltown, as well as what to do with the computation engine, but they would then also have to determine the fate of a nebulous group of synths, either enslaving them to help automate the factory and help it run more smoothly, freeing them so they could live as equals among the humans, or destroying them to the detriment of Markham's hopes of ever fully automating the facility. So, there you have it. Five intriguing locations that were ultimately cut from Wasteland 3, despite the fact that there are some pretty compelling signs they were already at least partially implemented into the launch version of the game. Now, I should note that it is still possible that we'll end up seeing at least a few of these locations added to the campaign at some point in the future. The developers recently confirmed that they are considering things like post-launch content updates and possible DLC. It's also worth noting that In Exile does have something of a history when it comes to adding additional content in director's cut versions of their various games. We might even end up seeing some of these locations revisited in a potential sequel, as was the case with the Gippers, who were originally supposed to appear way back in Wasteland 2. That said, there's no guarantee that pretty much anything I've analyzed or speculated about will still be even remotely accurate if and when these locations are finally implemented. After all, at least some of these locations 
sound like they were originally intended to interact with the main storyline in various minor but important ways. So that might require some additional changes to better fit the campaign as it currently exists. It's also possible that they might just end up coming up with some entirely new twists and turns for these locations, or that I simply completely misinterpreted something. I guess we'll have to wait and see. At any rate, I think you fine folks have listened to me ramble quite enough for one day, so uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up for now. But I would like to say that I have really enjoyed talking about this stuff. While I do love playing well-crafted CRPGs like Wasteland 3, I'm equally intrigued by the deeper lore that surrounds some of these virtual settings. I guess that's why I'm particularly curious when it comes to unfinished content, because it gives me a rare opportunity to get an even deeper glimpse into these already fascinating worlds. It happened with Van Buren, it happened with Phoenix Point, and here it is happening again with Wasteland 3. I take that as a good sign. Anyway, you guys get the idea. Let me know in the comments if you found this stuff interesting, or if you have anything to add to it, or if you'd like to see more. And we'll be back in a couple of days with a slightly more conventional gameplay video. Until then, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for watching. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about games like Wasteland 3, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official Twitch or YouTube channels, the official social media feeds, or the official store pages. As always, links are in the description.